Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful and thankful for the opportunity that you give us to just feast upon your word together. We long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. We understand that our understanding is limited, but that we have you as our one teacher. We just give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. I ask that you would filter out that which is foolish and ignorant, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, hello, this is Steve again at uh, blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in the first uh, epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse, and we had just crossed over from chapter 10 to chapter 11. I think we're just now making the bridge between 10 and 11, these two chapters. And what we've seen is in chapter 10 is that we need to have communion. Uh, and that particularly regarding uh, Christ's death in our place, our, Him being our substitute, a substitutionary death. That's where we have our communion and our fellowship. Uh, we are told not to forsake the uh, assembling of ourselves together. And I believe that has direct uh, reference to that. Uh, because this is why we assemble together, is to feast upon Christ and to put great emphasis on the truth of His Word and how that impacts our lives and our relationships with one another. Uh, so we're looking at another chapter division, and as I've pointed out in the past, uh, there were no chapter divisions in the original text. And so uh, we're looking at whether or not verse 1 here of chapter 11 looks backwards or whether it looks ahead. I think that we are looking at a body context. Uh, this is a church context, a formal uh, church context. Uh, it's, uh, we're looking at basically what it, uh, is, uh, uh, I, I believe it, at least the picture that, that we're looking at here is one of a church context. It's not the, the woman in the home or the man in the home, or, but we're looking at a church context. Verse 1 says, Be ye followers of me, even as also, as I also am of Christ. Now that's a heavy statement because we can be a Christian and we can be a follower and not be a follower of Paul or a, a follower of Christ in the sense that the revelation that God gave Paul for the church uh, it doesn't really apply all that much to our lives. Maybe we're going to operate in uh, the synoptic function mostly out of the synoptic gospels and we're you know we're, we don't we fail to understand that the dispensation that we're under which is one of grace God gave the word of God to he gave it to Paul to complete the word of God he's our primary example and we're to follow him uh, so first and foremost this is God's word not Paul's it's something that I've emphasized numer on numerous occasions uh, the word uh, follower there is the word mimic that's the word to imitate so i want to talk just a little bit about that uh, to mimic what does it mean to mimic someone or 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 in this case paul you need to first and foremost understand that uh, mimicking uh, imitating god and which we uh, we have a verse that says that we're to imitate god as well but to imitate god or to imitate Paul, to, to be a follower of God or to be a follower of Paul is primarily, God is primarily concerned with the, matter, the subject of truth, the truth of this book, the truth of God's Word. We're to be a follower of the truth of God's Word. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And there is, right away we see that, uh, the first hint here of an arrangement of God's authority uh, you know, it's uh, now. I understand that many Christians look at, at these passages, and they and really they're just they they want to uh, they want to spend a whole lot of time debating, arguing uh, over the fact of 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 this being uh, Paul's reasoning, Paul's logic, uh, Paul's thoughts. Uh, you know, uh, not to take anything away from Paul, but this is God's word. Be ye followers of me. 
says God, the Holy Spirit, even as I, God, also am of Christ. Now, if you want to read it that way, that's the way I do. I, that's, that's the, at least first and foremost, that's what I see in the text. This is God's word, not Paul's. And the word imitate is just, means just that. It's uh, someone is setting a proper example. Uh, it's always used positively in the New Testament. In fact, seven times in the New Testament of, of followers of Christ emulating a uh, God-approved example. Uh, the supreme model is God himself, obviously. Uh, but of course, uh, to be a follower of God, uh, we, we can't be a follower of God without being a follower of God's word, God's truth. And so we should concern ourselves about what, what is what the truth is. Uh, Ephesians 5.1, when we did our study through the uh, marvelous epistle to the Ephesians uh, quite some time ago, uh, we saw in chapter 5 of, of, of verse 1 of chapter 5 of Ephesians that we are uh, imitators of God. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself uh, for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. There's, there's a lot to unpack in that verse. Uh, I probably didn't do that all that great a job when we went through Ephesians unpacking that verse, but that's a, a verse that you might want to spend a day or two in. Uh, second, Paul is said to be our example. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a trustworthy saying, worthy of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. I am the worst. And, and of course, uh, uh, and I've known Christians that would argue with that, Paul, and say, no, Paul wasn't the worst. They're the worst. You know, uh, I'm the worst. Okay, nobody, there's, there's no one uh, that can uh, hold a candle to me, you know, when it comes to that. Uh, Paul was the, the chief of all sinners. Why? And so we need to ask ourselves, why does the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, refer to, to Paul. This is, I understand Paul's writing this, but this is not Paul's word. This is God's word. Why does Paul consider himself to be the worst of all sinners? Well, we know that he, it was because he persecuted Christians and put Christians to death. He had every right to feel that way. Uh, I think what the text is saying is, is that we're, we're, we're all equally on the same standing when it comes to our standing before God in ourselves. Each one of, uh, of us could say that we are the chief of all sinners. Uh, sin is sin, and, uh, and that's just a, a matter of fact. Third, Paul was used uh, to complete the Word of God. So we're to be a follower of him. Now concerning women, and I posted to Facebook here recently how that, I, and I was, I did this in sort of a joking way. Uh, oftentimes, on uh, my humor doesn't, uh, uh, it fails to accomplish the purpose for which it was intended. But uh, that being uh, said, uh, in First Corinthians chapter fourteen, we're not there yet, uh, and and First Timothy two, we have two verses there you know, that, that, uh, that we need to look at. This is God's Word. Uh, uh, it's, it's a church, con a Corinthian church context, uh, I believe, is, uh, is what I'm going to suggest. Uh, but it is a church context. Uh, it's not uh, time limited. I've pointed this out before. It's God's Word is eternal. It's for every generation. So it's not really time limited, but in another sense it is. And I'm gonna, I hope to explain that. But it's not custom limited or tradition limited. Uh, we adjust uh, to the custom of our time. Is that, what we're, is that how we're to look at this? Are we to adjust to the custom, uh, customs and traditions of our time? Uh, you know, for example, you, know, you could say that uh, volleyball, uh, girls' volleyball, or the way that they dress and all that uh, today, uh, you know, if you think about it, that would have probably been considered, uh, uh, they would have been considered witches uh, several hundred years ago. 
you know, where do we draw the line? I mean, culture does change. The Corinthian church, they didn't have Sunday school. They didn't have air conditioners. They didn't have electric uh, lighting, uh, stained glass windows, or comfortable chairs like we do today. There's a lot that goes on in the church today that we don't see in the Bible. You know, were they wrong or are we wrong? You know, we need to be cautious we, because we don't want to find ourselves struggling for a way out of what the text is about to tell us here. Uh, I think many have struggled for a way out of what the text says here, uh, and they've done that ever since it was written. Now, I suppose a person could look at this as time or custom oriented, but th th there's a lesson in this for us here in, in the year 2022. You know, why couldn't it be since there are many uh, examples like that? You know, one example would be I don't offer sacrifices. We don't offer sacrifices, but there's a lesson in that for us, and we're going to be looking at head coverings and uh, as it relates to men and women in the church. This is a church context. And so uh, there is a lesson here for us. But I want you to, to ask yourselves as we go along here, is it really all about scarves or the length of a person's hair? Is that really the, the crux of the matter? Is that, are we now under law? We're, not, we're no longer under grace. And so this is a, a mandate here you know, concerning uh, hair coverings or, or the length of, of, of the woman's hair or the man's hair. Uh, we need to ask ourselves a lot of questions. Folks, I agonize a lot over these verses. And that is because I really am concerned about, first and foremost, I mean, myself being l misled, uh, misinterpreting these texts, uh, and adopting that into my overall theology where that I've really basically derailed and I've gone off track someplace. And, and then even more so when I'm sharing what I believe with others. I do not want to teach error. I'd rather die than teach error. Um, so, you know, we don't offer sacrifices. So, I mean, uh, but there's something to learn in that, okay? Uh, perhaps we cover our head, we don't cover our head, but there's got to be something here deeper than that, something for us to, that it, we can gain from this. Now, verse 2 says, Now I praise you, brethren. I praise you, brethren. Now, if we just stopped right there. I hear you have God. Think about it, folks. You've got, you're looking at God the Holy Spirit actually praising these believers at Corinth for something. God praising them. And I think that's wonderful. Now, as we read on, we're going to find out there's something that he doesn't praise them for. But I, what I hope to do is I hope to try to tie a little bit of what we've seen in, before this into what we see now and what we, we're going to see ahead to try to get a, 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 an accurate picture of just what it is, what the, what the thought is that the Holy Spirit's trying to convey here. I praise you, brethren. God is not, is not ashamed to call us brethren. Again, I emphasize, this is God's word, not Paul's. And that, that you remember me, you could say God, in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. And now we're looking at guarding, keeping, guarding, okay? It's not doing it's guarding the ordinances that were delivered, that was delivered to us, and that what? Through Paul in completing the Word of God. This is God's Word, not Paul's. And so the Holy Spirit is praising us that we accept them for what they are, ordinances. Uh, it, is, uh, it is what the apostolic uh, authority taught by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's what we call Bible doctrine, and God praises them for this. That's interesting given the fact that of all the discussion that we've had in the past about their carnality, acting carnal when they're not, they're spiritual, but they've been acting carnal, and yet we see God praises them 
that he remembers him in all things, and, he, and they keep the ordinances as they were delivered unto him. Ordinances. Uh, verse 2 uh, of or Second Thessalonians in chapter 2, verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. How are they delivered to us? Well, in the written word. The written word wasn't complete during the days of Corinth, but it is now. I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is praising us that we believe His word. And I think that's wonderful. Verse 3, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So we see this order, this arrangement, that's a divine order and a divine arrangement. And uh, automatically, Christians all around the world, uh, particularly women, are very cautious when they approach this text. Because there's this sense that automatic, it's just, I know I believe it's of the flesh, but the automatic reaction here is, is that this is a situation of this one being worth more, the other being worth less, and that is not the case at all. At all. I mean, think of it though. God is giving thanks that we believe in His Word. But, I would have you know, the head of every man is Christ. The head of every man is Christ. Now, we're going to look at the head coverings here. When you, when you read that word head, I want you to keep in mind that there's something here literal, physical, like a head covering or hair, which represents, symbolically, represents some, a, a truth that is far, far greater than, I think, anything that we could possibly imagine. The head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. The text, folks, is telling us that Christ is not the head of the woman, but her husband is. And the head of Christ is God. Every man, that is male, Okay, the, the, the word there in the original text is the Greek word for male. Praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. Well, who is his head? Well, it's Christ. And any man that puts something between him and Christ disgraces Christ. Okay, if I put anything between me and Christ. I dishonor Christ. I disgrace Christ. Likewise, every woman praying or prophesying with her head uncovered disgraces her head. Now, who's her head? Her husband, the man. Who is her head? The man. And and I understand the resistance, the automatic resistance that there is to that, even within the Christian community. I mean, we, we can expect, the, we shouldn't be surprised at how the world re reacts to that. Uh, but even within the body of Christ, there's this idea that, that we're all equal, that there is no real divine order, and that's not what the text is showing us. Because what we're looking at is a, a, a literal, physical, manifestation here in the body of Christ, uh, a way of conduct which represents a greater spiritual reality which we're going to talk about. And that's what's important. Now then, verse 10, I'm going to jump ahead for this, uh, and this is, uh, for this reason the woman ought to have a, a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Why is that important to angels? Well, the relationship of God with men is something that angels watch and learn from. We know that from 1 Peter 1.12. Therefore, a, a woman's submission to God's delegated authority over her is an example to angels, the holy angels. And we're talking about 
angels who are in perfect and total submission to God. And so I think that they expect that we, the body of Christ, we do the same. Since the body of Christ, the church, is joined to Christ and is one flesh, just as the husband and, and the wife are one flesh. You know, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. We are, we are of Christ. We're in Christ. We are, if, if there's a, a wife, if, if we have a wife in our life, then we're to love her as Christ loved the church. And that's a, that's, a, that's a heavy calling for a husband to do. What does it mean to love my wife as Christ loved the church? Well, does God have anything against us? Uh, is there any condemnation there? Uh, are we not concerned about uh, the, the meaning of the very meaning of the word love itself? Love is the giving of oneself, not, not one's stuff, okay, but the giving of oneself for the ultimate good of another expecting nothing in return. You, you wouldn't be loving your spouse if you gave her something that would harm her. Uh, now I understand that covering, it, it not only means a cloth, it can also refer to a woman's hair length. And, and so now, I mean, how can, I, how can we say that? Well, we got to take this verse in the context or the setting in which it's presented. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him? I was joking on Facebook uh, one day with one of, one of my brothers about my, or uh, sisters, I can't remember, about my hair length. How that, you know, because I'm kind of into the cowboy western sort of dress sort of look and, and everything. And I understand cowboys, you know, have short hair. Many do. Uh, I always sort of imagined myself as more of the, the renegade, you know, the long-haired, desperado-type, you know, person. You know, the reason I keep my hair, try to keep my hair short, is because I do not want to have anything in between, in between me. I understand that what the symbolic language there. I, I don't want anything on my head when I'm praying and prophesying because I do not want to disgrace my head, okay? I also don't want to veil, you know, the glory of God of which I've been made into the image of the glory of God. Been made in His image. Uh, the man has been made in the image of God. He's the very glory of God. Uh, if a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. That's in the 11th chapter. Uh, verses 14 and 15 here in our present study. Therefore, in the context of this passage, a woman uh, who's wearing her hair longer marks herself out distinctively as a woman and not a man. Now, I'm going to try really, really hard to avoid the political correctness uh, garbage that we see taking place around us today. I don't want to get off onto that. I hope that YouTube's algorithms doesn't pick up on, on what I'm really suggesting, going to suggest here and, and, and misconstrue it, misunderstand it, or that, you know, the video is banned or the channel is taken down because, you know, I've you know, delivered the most anti-woke message of uh, Blessed Hope Forever's, in Blessed Hope Forever's history. Uh, it doesn't serve any purpose to, for that to happen. I hope that doesn't happen. But I cannot, for the sake of political correctness, and will not, for the sake of political correctness, uh, avoid uh, uh, at least giving you folks my impression, my, my opinion on what these verses mean. Uh, the Apostle Paul is saying here that in the Corinthian culture, when a wife's hair was longer than her husband's, it showed her submission to his headship. Uh, the church is subject to Christ. And the, so her t and this is her testimony. Uh, keep in mind, the ancient, uh, mind you, uh, uh, roles of the male and female are designed by God to portray a profound spiritual lesson. 
and that is of submission to the will and the authority of God. That is what the that is the church's primary responsibility. The woman represents that as the one espoused to Christ, who is to be the bride of Christ. The woman, you have a one, you know, it's uh, most Christians, I'm sure, are aware of the fact that what we're looking at is a is a picture here. You know, when we're looking at, at men and women, uh, we're looking at a, a picture of Christ and the church. Uh, but why is hair an issue in this passage? Uh, and why do so many approach this passage and just try to understand it from the only the, the, the earthbound standpoint here of whether uh, we're talking about a scarf, a, he a hat, uh, a uh, some hair uh, length uh, or whatever, and, and this is now, it's, it's all about, we're just looking at rules and conduct within the church, really doesn't have any, any you know, extended meaning, doesn't have any spiritual meaning, it's just, it's all, this is all, you know, our attention are, are on things, our attention's on things earthly here, not heavenly. And we miss seeing the, the picture, I think, that the Holy Spirit is trying uh, to convey. Now, historically speaking, Paul is addressing an issue related to the Corinthian culture that was being allowed to disrupt the church. You know, for a woman to have a shaved head was a disgrace, and in, in the minds of Jews, the, the Jewish thinking, you know, it was a sign of mourning. You know, you see that in Deuteron Deuteronomy. Uh, uh, her hair was her glory. Uh, we see that right here in our, in our present text. Uh, you know, in the Corinthian culture, uh, women normally wore a head covering as a symbol of their submission to their husbands. And Paul affirms the rightness of following that cultural mandate. To, dis to, to get rid of the, the head coverings on women would send an entirely wrong signal to uh, the culture at large. In fact, Paul says that if a Christian woman refuses her head covering, she might as well just shave all her hair off. That's uh, verse 6. You know, a woman who refused to wear a covering in that culture was basically saying, I refuse to submit to God's order. Therefore, the Apostle Paul, and more particularly God, is teaching the Corinthians that hair length or the wearing of a covering by the woman was an outward indication of a hard attitude of submission to God and to His established authority. God's order is that the husband is the head of the wife, as God is the head of Christ, but there's no, there is no inequality here or inferiority implied, which people want to read that into that. It's just not there. God and Christ are equal and united just as the husband and the wife are one flesh. This is not a passage that teaches the, women, the woman is inferior to man or that she ought to be submissive to every man. It's teaching God's order and spiritual headship in the, in the marriage relationship. You know, in the culture there of, of Corinth, uh, a woman who covered her head during worship or, or, when, or when she was in public, you know, displayed her submission to authority. In today's culture, that in the year 2022, uh, we no longer view a woman's wearing of a head covering as a sign of submission. You know, in, in most modern societies, uh, scarves and hats are, are fashion accessories. A woman has a choice to wear a head covering if she views it as a, as a sign of her submission to the authority of her husband. However, it is a personal choice and not something that should be used to judge spirituality. Uh, and I can just see this. I can see this at the church in Corinth. You know, you've got one woman over here that's wearing a head covering, or wearing her, her hair is long, her, head's, her, hair, her head is covered, and you have one whose hair is not. And, you know, there's right away, there's, you know, well, look at her. You know, she's not, you know. The real issue here, folks, is the hard attitude of obedience to God's authority and submission to His established order as unto the Lord. That's the concern here. 
so the hard fact is that many Christian women today think God created them in His own likeness. I do not believe the text says that. Now that may upset a lot of women, especially you know those uh, who uh, believe that they were made in the image of God. They've heard that all their lives. They're, they're, they're made in God's image. I do not believe that's what the text says. Uh, God did not make women in an image of His own likeness, so don't blame me. All right, God created man in his own image. So man is the image of God. The woman is in the image of man. By one man sin entered the world. Therefore, any man that puts something between him and Christ disgraces Christ. And likewise, every woman praying or prophesying with her head uncovered disgraces her head, man. And it's a disgrace to be shorn. Uh, and no, no woman likes to be bald. You know, and, and here's the truth, folks. I've known some wives who are more capable of teaching than their husbands. They know they're much more knowledgeable. They're much more faithful. They have, they're much more devoted. Uh, so do I think that they ought to be allowed to teach? Well, no, I don't. Uh, if she does, she disgraces her head. That is her husband. Do we teach God? Does the church teach God? It's not that... You've got to understand, folks, we're looking at a woman here who's, who's made in the image, a likeness of man. She was taken from man. She represents... In, in her very existence is one which represents in a very dynamic way, a very symbolic way, the church's relationship to Christ. There's nothing more honorable than that. The silence of women in the church, folks, is saying the church, the woman, doesn't teach Christ. Her head, her, her head is the husband. She's to learn from her husband at home, okay? But we, just as the wife learns from her husband at home, so does the church. Uh, you know, one of the effects of the fall on women was wanting them wanting to control their husbands. Now you may disagree with that, and you're I welcome you know you're welcome to do that. But Genesis three sixteen, if you study that verse carefully, you'll see that her where it says that her desire shall be for her husband. That isn't lusting after her husband. The text is saying that her desire shall be to control her husband, and we're going to look at that uh, uh, at some point. But men were made in God's image and glory. Therefore, men shouldn't be covered since that would be to cast a veil. In my opinion, that's casting a veil over God's image and glory. Uh, women shouldn't be uncovered since that would reflect the church wanting to exercise authority over God. Uh, in speaking for God, you know, uh, let them remain silent. God is not, folks, subject to the church. The text is not teaching women are of less value than men. It's not a, a matter of less than or more than. Bear in mind, neither, neither, none of us, neither men nor women, would have any value if it were not for this divinely established order. Woman is the glory, the, the, the value of man. Glory means value or worth. Okay, so woman is the glory of man because she was created in man's image. Her head is man, just as the head of the church is Christ. A man's worth or value to God is seen as in his being head of the woman, just as Christ is head of the church. Man, made in the image of, and glory of God, should be nothing between himself and God. No other mediator. Uh, 
woman. Her head is man. She's the glory of man. Is given long, she's given long hair by God as a covering to honor man who's her head. And all of this is a testimony to the... Well, it's a testimony to many things. It's a testimony to the deity of Christ, the efficiency of Christ, uh, His person, His work, God's established order, uh, His substitutionary death in our place, Christ being the head of the church, the church being subject to Christ. You know, uh, as God pronounces judgment on Eve, you know, for her part of the transgression in, in, in uh, Eden, you know, he says, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Genesis 3.16. And that verse causes a little bit of puzzlement. You know, because it would seem that a woman desiring her husband would be a good thing, not a curse. The, the Hebrew phrase in question does not include a verb and is literally translated toward your husband, your desire, since... I hardly know how to put this into words, but your desire will be for your husband. The most basic and straightforward understanding of that verse is that women, uh, the woman and the man would now have ongoing conflict. You know, in contrast to the, uh, those ideal conditions in the Garden of Eden and the harmony between Adam and Eve, their relationship from that point on would include a power struggle. Uh, the NLT translation uh, makes it really more evident. You will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. That's what the text is saying. God's saying that, that Eve would desire to rule over her husband, but her husband would instead rule over her, replacing the mutually independent relationship the Lord had created was, uh, you know, uh, was a desire for one spouse to lead the other. Sin had wreaked havoc. The battle of the sexes had begun. Both man and woman would now seek the upper hand in marriage. The man who was to lovingly care for and nurture his wife would now seek to rule her, and the wife would desire to wrest control from her husband. And it's, I think it's important to note that this judgment only states what will take place. God says that man and woman will live in conflict and their relationship will become problematic. The statement, He shall rule over you, is not a biblical command for men to dominate women. Okay. In the New Testament, God affirms His ideal relationship between man and woman in marriage. Christ-like qualities are emphasized what the curse of sin created, believers in Christ are called to, to correct by living according to God's Spirit. You know, Ephesians 5 says the wife should willingly submit to her husband's authority in the home, uh, in essence, refusing to uh, scratch the curse-fueled itch to seize control. Husbands are to love their wives unconditionally and sacrificially, just as Christ loves the church. You know, the whole passage begins with an emphasis on mutual submission to one another. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You know, from the beginning, God's focus has been uh, love and respect between husband and, and wife. Uh, and even though sins tainted the original beauty of this relationship, God commands believers in Christ to pursue this ideal relationship between husband and wife an ideal perfectly illustrated in Christ's relationship with the church. That is what we're looking at God praising these Corinthian believers for. Verse 14 says, Doth, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. I think the text is saying, let's don't argue over what God said. God created short and long hair. You know, that's, that's why I can't make this as the, the custom uh, of, the, of the time only. You know, if you do and you have peace with the Lord on that, then uh, that's fine. I can't. God has told us that man is in the image of God. 
that woman is subject to the man, that man is her head, and that the illustration of that is nothing on man's head between him and the Lord, just as there is nothing between Christ and the Father, and that there is something on woman's head between her and Christ, and that is the man. Just like the man Christ Jesus stands in between the church and God. But, verse 16, if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, says Paul, neither the churches of God. What I believe Paul, or more specifically, God, is saying here is that being contentious is not our custom. It's not our custom here or in any of the churches of God. Well, at least we've cracked the ice on chapter 11. I want to thank you all for everything that you do to help support this channel. Uh, uh, for all your prayers, your comments, your words of encouragement. We're so deeply appreciative of that. Uh, rest in Him. God loves you with an un everlasting love. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.